Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's WCET webcast. Um, my name is Kim Naraki. I'm the Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET. I'm going to go through a few housekeeping slides, and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us. Today's webcast is Strategy, Vision, and academic success, academic affairs, I'm so sorry, a framework for successful online learning. And we're hosting today's webcast in partnership with HonorLock. I'm gonna to introduce today's moderator, um, Megan Raymond, and, and then we'll turn it over to the panelists. Great, thank you so much. Hi everybody, thank you for being part of this webinar conversation today. We're gonna to go through some content, but we wanna make sure to get to your questions. So make sure to enter those into the Q&A. And then um, we'll also be monitoring the chat. So engage in the chat conversation. Kim will be sharing a link to the PowerPoint as well. Again, my name is Megan Raymond and I lead membership programs and sponsorship here at WCET. And one of my favorite parts of my job is that I get to connect with people doing cool work all over the United States, including many of you on this call. And some of those friends are Darcy Hardy, a long, long, long time friend of WCET. She used to be on our, or she's currently on our executive council. And then Jordan Adair with Honor Lock. So I'm going to go ahead and let them do their introductions. And I'm going to pop into chat and I'd love to see you know, where you're at and what the weather's like. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, my name's Darcy Hardy. I'm the founder and chief strategist for the Hardy Group. Um, I know so many of you, I think they're on this call and probably could speak to the same issues I'm going to speak to, but I've been involved in distance and online learning since the late 80s, 30 years in uh, higher education, 10 years in corporate, three years in federal. So uh, I've worked with a lot of institutions uh, across the country and around the world. So happy to be here. And hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan Adair. I head up the product team at HonorLock, which is uh, an online proctoring company. I uh, used to be a, a former teacher, spent some time teaching elementary school and middle school before getting into the ed tech world. And in uh, my 10 plus years experience in ed tech, I've been focused on secure assessment in all the companies that I've worked for. So great to be here. All right, well, we're going to jump right in. Um, so I wanna talk about the strategy of online learning and I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes or so um, about this. And, you know, I, many of you may have heard me speak about strategic planning with online learning and maybe ad nauseum um, for some of you, like why does she keep talking about this strategic planning? Why does this keep coming up and doesn't she think we that we get it yet? You know, and it's it's not so much that I don't think people like you get it. Um, I can I have concerns about some of the leadership at institutions not really understanding all of the various pieces that go into online learning and to build that high quality ecosystem for online. I also have very deep concerns about the Department of Education and Congress not understanding how to build high quality online learning programs. Um, in Congress, you've got folks that think what we did during COVID is online learning. Uh, at the department, um, we are in a continuous <laughs> battle with them understanding distance learning and online learning <clears throat> and the benefits of those. So what I want to do today, uh, I'm going to introduce you to our online program quality framework that the Hardy Group has, has designed. Um, I'm gonna go around each of these, just briefly talk about a few points and then zero in a little bit on academic affairs before I pass it over to Jordan. So um, let's go ahead and start with vision and strategy. So Kim, if you can move that slide. When I talk to people about this framework, <clears throat> you know, you noticed on the framework that it was a, a loop, but at the top, and you can even see it on this slide, the black bubble at the top, um, representing its place in the framework, it's at the top for a reason. Um, and that reason is that I believe without a clear vision of where the institution is going uh, and a strategic plan to get from point A to point B, it's very difficult to 
really create these robust, high quality uh, online programs. So when I work with institutions, when my group works with institutions, the first thing we do is spend time on vision. And some of you may have different definitions of a vision for an institution or for uh, online learning. When I talk about vision, I want to know what does the leadership want to do? Where do they want to go? And in how much time? Is it increasing enrollments by 5% in 20, by 2026? Is it launching five new programs next year, which I would question, how do you know you just need five or which five? Um, but everybody has to be on the same page for that. And once you have the vision, and it can take some time. If you're doing your own strategy work, you know that coming up with the vision takes some time, but you've got to have that realistic vision. And if it takes a long time or a few weeks to get there, so be it. Because once you have that strategy, then you can look at the items in this vision and strategy um, slide and in our framework. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I do want to mention one thing. The institutional readiness part, um, it, it doesn't matter if you've done all your market research and you have identified programs you want to offer. If your institution is not prepared to reach and, and serve the students and the faculty that will be involved in these programs, you are not ready. So for vision and strategy, these are big pieces that have to be at the forefront before and during you address the other parts of the framework. So let's go to the next slide. We're gonna come back and focus more on academic affairs. So you're, gonna, you're going to hear me dig a little deeper into both the faculty development and the curriculum and course development um, areas. But you'll notice the word departmental readiness is here. Like I had institutional readiness on the first slide. Departmental readiness is the same kind of thing that I said a moment ago. If you do the market research, if you do everything you need to do to find out, man, this program would be great to offer and the department or the college that's not supposed to offer it is not on board and there's no buy-in, you've got serious problems there. And that's an academic issue. I make the argument quite often, and I think we're, we're now at this point, you know, for so long, everyone looked at online learning as a technology endeavor, um, an IT endeavor. IT, super important. Technology, super important. But these are academic programs and need to be treated as such. So when you're looking at this framework, and I will talk more about faculty development and curriculum and course design, please don't forget about this departmental and college readiness, and also the alignment of the learning outcomes to the courses and um, that are the same for the on-campus programs if they exist. So we can go to the next slide. Another part of the framework is student supports. So um, I'll just give one example that people have often challenged me and others, and that's things, things like 24 by seven support for faculty and for students. So I say student supports can be faculty supports as well. People say, well, you know, our students hardly use the support, you know, over the weekends or in the evenings or, or whatever it might be. And my point to them is, from a marketing perspective, if you don't offer those kinds of services, you are alienating an audience. So it's almost like it, it doesn't matter if you don't get a giant number of students that are using some of these supports 24 seven, if you don't have it, that's going to be a knock against you when you're trying to put your programs out there. The other thing I'll mention here um, is communications. And this is true for um, any types of communications with students. My partner uh, in the Hardy Group, Rob Robinson, he speaks a lot about empathetic communications. And what that means is that, number one, you are aware that your institution is probably communicating way too much with students, and it's coming from all sectors of the institution to the point where the students, they're not even sure what's important and what's not. So getting your communications act together is really important when you're serving these students so they know what's important, what's not. The other thing is 
they are often greeted with communications, unfortunately, from some of the support areas, not intentionally, but admissions, registrar's office that are kind of, you know, you didn't do this. So you got to mark against you and you got to do this right now. Instead of being more empathetic and understanding that these students are dealing with a lot of issues. So the communications, and you're going to hear more about empathy in a minute from Jordan, the communications to these students have to have a little level of empathy. It's not a gotcha. Um, the final thing about communications that I'll mention, when I was at Anthology, we did a great global study on looking for the gaps between senior leadership at institutions and the students and what their expectations are. You might already know this, but when you ask leadership at institutions, what is the best form of communication that we use to get to students? Email. The students will tell you they want just in time, they want AI, they want to know what's important, what's not. It can be by email, but so many of these students, they don't check their university emails, they check their personal emails. So having good communications are a big part of supporting those students. So again, these four areas that we have under student supports should all be considered when you're thinking about uh, establishing, growing, scaling online programs. So we can go to the next slide. EdTech, okay. So I mentioned a moment ago that online learning is an academic endeavor. It depends quite a bit on ed tech in various ways. Um, but in order to make the full ecosystem work, the ed tech has to be working with the academic affairs side of the house. I've worked with schools where the CIO and the vice provost, vice president of academic affairs do not see eye to eye on what is best for their institution. Um, I used to refer to it as, I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, the rivalry between Texas A&M Aggies and the University of Texas Longhorns. It's a long time rivalry. Well, across this state, you have houses that are split, right? There's Aggies and there's Longhorns and ne'er the two shall meet, right? There's, they're always gonna be in their, their bubble um, for kind of funny reasons, but it is a tradition. Well, the same thing can be true with your IT department and your academic affairs folks. There's this friction between the two because IT needs to support what the academics want. The academics want certain things. IT may not be able to support it. The ed tech inventory, it's funny when we work with institutions and we ask the CIO, do you know what ed tech everyone is using on your campus? Beyond the LMS uh, and some other you know, larger technologies, most of the CIOs would say, we don't, we just don't know because a faculty member will go to a conference and maybe they win a piece of software that will be great for their, um, for their, if their students and they have good intentions, then they call IT to help them install it. And IT is like, what is this? We have policies about this. So, you know, knowing what's on the campus from an ed tech perspective is critical and working hand in hand with the academics to make sure that everyone is on the same page. I'm not going to go into AI because that's a whole nother session. Um, but it is a technology and it's got to be something that the campus is aware of. Again, this is in the ecosystem framework for online learning. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Last but not least is market and marketing. You know, Online learning is an all skate, and people have heard me say that, meaning everybody's on the floor. Everybody's involved. It's not just, you know, the registrar's office, the administration, administrators, the deans, the faculty senate, the faculty, et cetera. It's everyone. Well, everyone needs to be in on what the offerings are, and they need to understand how they're organized in order to meet the needs of getting the marketing out there. The marketplace now, after COVID, is huge. It's highly competitive. So when you're identifying programs and looking at program viability, you can't just say, well, you know, our MBA does so great on campus, we're going to put one online. 
please don't do that. There are, we're flooded with MBAs. There's, there's way too many. You should be looking for niche programs at your institution that other people don't offer that you can um, put out there and see good enrollments because you're thinking outside the box. You're thinking of things that your institution does that others don't. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, a geology program like at Sol Ross University out in West Texas, you know, not every school offers these really well-known programs. Um, but when I said earlier about departmental and institutional readiness, et cetera, et cetera, if you are not, if you're identifying programs based on market and program viability, and you are not meshing that with departmental and college readiness and institutional readiness, then it's all for naught. So it's got to be where, you, um, where you're all on the same page. It's an all skate. Everyone has to talk about this. You don't just, prick a, <laughs> don't just pick a program because even though the viability looks good, you can't just pick it because of that. You have to make sure that the, the college or school and departments are on board too. I'll tell you a quick story that I've told before. Um, when I ran the UT Telecampus, which was, was the 15 campus consortium uh, for the University of Texas system, we built collaborative programs. So we'd, we'd put UT San Antonio with UT Brownsville and UT El Paso, and we'd build collaborative programs, taking the cream of the crop courses from those schools and meshing them together. So one of them that we did, and this is in the you know fairly early 2000s, was a computer science uh, engineering program out of two institutions in the UT system. The problem was the deans were all over it and they knew it would be a great program. But they didn't involve the faculty in the decision. So, you know, two years into the program, we had to stop it because the faculty were MIA. They were, they were so mad that this was being forced on them without them being ready and engaged. We had to stop the program. Okay, well, that's fine, except that, according to our creditors, the rules are if you start a program completely online and that's how you've marketed it, and that's what the students expect, you have to finish that cohort of students online. So a, that was a big challenge because the schools didn't want to offer the program anymore. So all of these pieces go into market and marketing. A lot of people outsource their marketing, which is great. Sometimes it just takes some internal organization to do it in-house. So with all of that, with all of those buckets that are part of, of uh, our framework, let me go back to the uh, academic affairs. And I wanna talk a little bit about a couple of things with academic affairs. So these are those same framework elements that you saw in my slide. Um, digging a little bit deeper. Um, when you're talking about the framework uh, and the various pieces, two that jump out specifically are faculty development and curriculum and course development. Um, these play such a huge role into the academic offering for your online programs. And, you know, combined with the departmental readiness, your faculty development and your departmental readiness go hand in hand. If the faculty aren't prepared, plus if they're not on board, you've got a disaster. So those four elements make such a difference in the quality of your program. So much during COVID, um, and, and you know, God bless every faculty member, every instructional designer, every dean, every leader in institutions for what they did during COVID. Fabulous. But we'll talk about this in a minute. What we did during COVID was great to serve those students at the time. Those courses, a vast number of those courses are not and were not high quality and yet they are still running. Um, and the faculty haven't been, they haven't increased the faculty development. And so they're just these shells with a link to Zoom or whatever you're using, a, you know, maybe a discussion board and some, uh, some the uh, textbooks. That is not what's going to work if you're going to be competitive in the future. We can go to the next slide. Now, talking about faculty development, and this is where the policies come in, and I am a bit of a policy wonk. 
I know on campuses, lots of faculty do not like to hear the word policy uh, or mandate or anything like that. I believe that first of all, you have to have policies around the quality standard. You have to have policies around how courses are designed and faculty are, are to go through professional development. And I would urge you to refer to your faculty development as that, not training. Training is teaching them how to use the buttons and everything that goes into the LMS and the other tools that they're using. Faculty development is helping them understand course design, pedagogy, teaching online versus teaching in the classroom, developing extra skills. Some of you have campuses where the faculty are the only ones who can develop courses because you either don't have designers or have chosen to just have you know one or two and it's not enough. So part of that professional development has to be about instructional design. They've got to understand the basics of instructional design so that they can build the courses as, as expected. They also need to use, uh, they need, need to think about development for their assessments. I mentioned at the very beginning that I was talking about the communication and empathetic communication. Assessment development is the same way. Using empathetic um, uh, mindsets, um, testing students for what they know and what not what they don't know so many times. And I remember at my own college education, I, I felt like it was a gotcha kind of thing. It was a, let's find what you, what you, let me dig in some little minuscule fact and see if you can remember it. Instead of thinking about what is it the students need to know and how can I assess them in a way that allows them to demonstrate communication with them using AI. I'm gonna let Jordan talk about that in a moment. And then there's also regulatory requirements. So, you know, depending on the discipline, there may be specific uh, requirements that come for a specific discipline for faculty. So, you know, understanding that faculty development isn't just, you know, putting them through some kind of training and some pedagogy and things like that. It is all of this. And when people say, I can't require my faculty to do anything, this is where communication comes in again. Get these people on board, help them understand why it's so important um, to understand how to do this. This is not 2000 or 1999 again. We are at a point where it's costly, you're trying to market, you want the highest quality programs. And so at the very least, following COVID, all of you went through the fact that faculty weren't ready. Not their fault, but they weren't ready. If you have at least a baseline of faculty development that's required, just a baseline, they don't have to go on and on and get people all upset about having to go through all of it, but at least a baseline so that every faculty member at least has some type of development to help them with this online world. That's my sign, I'm talking too much. One more slide. Oh, no, two more slides. I love, oh, you can go back. I love this quote. Now it's from 1921, but it speaks to everything that I believe about what we learned during COVID and what we have to do now. You cannot just cobble these courses and programs together. Well, you can but they're not going to be high quality. They're going to be like pieces here and there and grab that course, grab that course with no coordination. So well-planned and developed courses and programs are the key to going into the future. Okay, that's my soapbox on that one. We'll go to the next slide. So course design and development. Um, I was in a session, oh, I think at WCT. And one of the questions that we asked was, how many instructional designers do you have on your campus? And one person said 24. Well, I found out after the session that they're an online curriculum development group. Um, or if it's an online institution, I'll see where they have lots of instructional designers. But I know all of you can relate to the fact that some schools have one, some schools have two. 
maybe there's four or five. Um, and sometimes when there's four or five, there's decentralized. So you've got this instructional designer working in the College of Business, another one in the School of Education, another one in engineering, and they're not talking to each other. They're not working together. So you don't have to centralize them in the true sense of all in one building, but they need to be centralized in a way so that they can learn from each other and build a community and make sure they're all hitting the same quality standards. So if you're a QM school, you have a policy that all of your courses are gonna hit QM standards or your own standards or whatever it is, every one of those instructional designers needs to be on the same page. They should be meeting regularly. They should be, they should be getting professional development as well. And part of the communication, the responsibility you have is to make sure that faculty understand that instructional designers are there to make them look good. Instructional designers, they can take a course and make it look so much better than faculty can because faculty's job should not be designing courses. They should be working with designers. Now, if they are on their own and there's no instructional designers, then at this part, this course development and design needs to be part of their professional development. They need to understand the process. All schools, all designers at every school should at least follow the same process. That doesn't mean that you're stepping on academic freedom. It doesn't mean that one instructional designer may have a different skill set in one area over somebody else. It just means you're all following the process and that everyone is on the same page so that you all know where the courses are, where they are in development, what's their maintenance schedule, all of these really important things that make the course design and development good. If you don't have solid course design development, solid faculty development, it's very difficult to build a strategy to meet the vision of getting point from point A to point B. So, you know, one of the things that course development and design has to figure out as well is authentication. Um, authentication is a big deal with the Department of Education. I'm sure you already all know this. Um, uh, RSI, uh, what is it? <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Um, substantive substantive. Never, substantive. I've gotten so used to calling it RSI, I don't say it. Um, regular and substantive interaction. I know all of you have heard of this as well. The course design and development is a key part of that regular and substantive interaction. And it also, we're getting more and more into that, that place where once again, even though you can walk into a classroom of 400 students, there's no real attendance being taken in most of those. And that's, I, I've, I've said this for years, that is distance learning. 400 students in class, professor or TA, and there's really no interaction. But yet, in online, all three of these issues, authentication, RSI, attendance, are targeted. And so, you know, what do you do about that? Well, that's why I'm, I'm really happy that Jordan is here, because Jordan and Honorlock have done extensive research into some of these issues around empathy and talk about authentication and enabling attendance taking. And so for a moment, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan to talk about some of the research they, they have done, and then we'll open it up for QA at about 45 after. So Jordan, go ahead. Thanks, Darcy. So yeah, transitioning from your coverage on kind of the curriculum and course design front, I want to talk about something that plays a big part in both of those, and that's the assessment environment to start with. You know, it's not just about having great, great course content. Your assessments need to be delivered in a way that accurately reflect what your students have learned. But the thing is, students aren't just battling the test questions. There's a lot of research showing how test anxiety can really tank exam performance. And we've also conducted some studies on this front. The, uh, you know, the potential impact of test anxiety is not a one size fits all thing. The, some assessments are more forgiving than others. Uh, some research has shown that uh, assessments like OSCEs seem to have very little impact from test anxiety, while more traditional multiple choice types exams seem to be harder on students who are feeling a, a lot of pressure from said test anxiety. 
There's also gender differences. Uh, female students generally report higher levels of test anxiety than male counterparts. And prior to us doing our study, we kind of looked at this number and there's varying degrees of reports on this, but what we found is, you know, studies have shown up to about 40% of students are affected by test anxiety. But when we did our own internal study, we were really focused on test anxiety related to online proctored exams, right? So uh, different than a lot of the research that's out there on this topic. And what we discovered was that 64% of the students in our study expressed that online testing made them particularly nervous. So larger than some of the other previous papers we had, we had looked through. Um, and we had uh, about 225, it was between two, 225, 250 participants in this study. So before I go into the details of our study and online testing, I'm gonna to try to explain a few simple ways uh, or in a few simple ways, what's happening in a student's brain that sort of uh, either triggers or what's happening during these bouts of test anxiety. So number one, you know, anxiety impairs the brain's processing efficiency, basically meaning that when a student's anxious, the anxiety is taking up cognitive space, right? Like they're working memory. And when a student has high anxiety levels, they're maxing out that working memory a lot sooner. Just basically, it means that they can't hold on to as much information during the test as they normally might be able to. Test anxiety can also lead to cognitive interference, which I would kind of equate to background noise while you're taking the test that never stops. It consumes the, some mental resources, making it harder for a student to focus on what they're supposed to be doing, which would be answering the test questions. So instead of focusing, they're spending brain power worrying about how well or how badly they're doing on the test, constantly wondering, you know, am I failing? Am I doing okay? Am I going to pass? And um, kind of tying back to some of what Darcy discussed, the test uh, and question design can play a big role in test anxiety. One of the ways uh, is called sequential demands. So the more structured that a task is, the better anxious students tend to do on it. So uh, that might sound a little bit counterintuitive at first, thinking that, you know, more steps, anxiety, maybe they don't go hand in hand. But in reality, the sequential tasks, they provide like a scaffolding or uh, cognitive support that helps the student compensate for some of the memory limitations that I mentioned before caused by their anxiety. So uh, thinking through like a well-structured step-by-step task, that can ease their burden by breaking the information down into some smaller chunks. Kind of think of it like uh, being given clear instructions one step at a time instead of just being dumped a huge pile of instructions in your lap, right? For anyone who's put together like IKEA furniture, <laughs> think of one part and if you put that part together and then you're gonna connect it to another part versus just getting the whole thing dumped onto the floor simultaneously. So thinking about maybe a real world example of what this might look like with uh, an exam question, Think of the, the first type, the, the negative example. A student's given a broad open-ended question like discuss the cause or the causes and effects of the American Revolution. They're gonna have to put together a whole lot of different ideas and facts there. And that could be overwhelming to some students that have test anxiety and might have some of that working memory already being overloaded from that anxiety. Now, an alternative way to maybe pull out that same information would be to break that question into more sequential steps. So you could pose, you know, first describe the key political factors that led to the American Revolution, then explain how economic conditions contributed, and then you know, summarize the main social effects. And so that structure kind of guides the student through the task one piece at a time, which makes it easier for them to follow and then reduces that cognitive load on their already anxious mind. So that approach can improve some performance for students who might be struggling with test anxiety, and you may get a, a more accurate representation uh, of what they know. And then um, finally here, another impact of anxiety is really a student's ability to judge their own performance. Not only is that, is that anxiety going to mess with their cognitive performance on the exam, but it also throws off their ability to predict how well they're doing. Usually students that have high anxiety, they tend to under predict their scores. So now they have this feedback loop of stress and self-doubt, which can somewhat sometimes be a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
So in a nutshell, anxiety makes it harder for students to process the information, steals their focus. It could shake their confidence, right? But there are strategies that can be put into place to help kind of navigate those challenges. So bringing this back to our study, we identified three key factors that lead to test anxiety in online proctored exams. And those three factors listed up here on the slides were number one, technology concerns, the fear that something's going to go wrong technically. That's a big anxiety trigger for online tests um, because the students feel like they don't have any control. They were in our study, they were particularly worried about things like internet outages, hardware malfunctions, or just running into difficulty using the software. Number two was misconceptions around AI and flags. A lot of students are freaked out by the idea of AI watching them, especially because they often mistakenly assume that any AI flag automatically means that they're being accused of cheating. Um, there were students, for example, that thought sneezing or coughing because their face would go out of view for a split second would result in them being investigated, right? Not the case, but that was the perception that the students had. And then third, uh, students had a misunderstanding of the role of the proctor. They, these students can also, they can feel uneasy when they don't understand how a proctor is going to monitor their test. And uh, a lot of students shared stories of past proctoring experiences with other software where proctors felt aggressive, rude, or accusatory. One of the quotes was they, they said they felt like the proctor was trying to fill a quota, right? So having that, some of those um, preconceptions definitely led to an increase in anxiety for the students. All right, you can go to the next slide, please. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how online proctoring can perhaps help reduce some of those anxieties if you structure things and prepare students the right way. So one of the biggest benefits of proctoring is that it levels the playing field. We heard from a lot of students during our focus group interviews that they were worried about classmates cheating. That was a, a cause for some of their anxiety. They felt that the playing field wasn't fair and that they weren't just anxious about their own performance, but they were also anxious about the possibility that some other group of students might cheat on the exam and throw off the grading curve or uh, something along those lines. And actually that's, that's why HonorLock was founded uh, back when the company first started is there was a group of students at uh, Florida Atlantic University down here in South Florida, and they saw that their peers were cheating and realized how much it was affecting the fairness of their exams, the, the, the curve, and they stepped in to try to create a solution for that problem. So that's what proctoring does, right? It steps in to ensure that cheating isn't part of the equation. And so now the students can focus on what they know, not what their classmates might be getting away with. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily just need to be used on high stakes exams. So uh, in fact, like when we did our study, we found that students who are familiar with HonorLock, they reported 15% less anxiety on uh, their proctor test, because the more that they know about what to expect, the less the less anxious they're going to feel when exam time rolls around. So, um, you know, whether it's a low or high stakes situation, proctoring can be tailored to the specific needs of that test. You don't need to overburden your students on a quiz with uh, the highest level of security. You can dial up your settings that, to make it appropriate for the environment, uh, appropriate for a lower stakes assessment. And next slide, please. So we're always trying at HonorLock to make the student experience better. Um, we know that you know reducing anxiety, it's not just about what happens during the test. A big part of that is what happens before the exam begins. And so that's why uh, we've really focused on three key areas of information, right? Sharing more information about the technology, more information about AI, and more information about proctor interactions. So when it comes to tech issues, you know, one of the ways we help reduce tech-related anxiety is through a feature we call Honor Prep. That allows students to walk through a tutorial-like experience so that they can get comfortable with our platform before their first real proctor test. That includes things like going through a system check, uh, granting access to their webcam, granting access to their microphone, 
other technical steps that are good to get out of the way well in advance of the test, you know, before anxiety levels are high. Our support team is also lightning fast. You know, Darcy talked a little bit about 24-7 support. We are certainly offering 24-7, 365 support. But not only that, our average response time is 15 seconds or less. So that's crucial for calming down a student if they run into tech problems. When you arrive quickly to help them start troubleshooting, and most of the issues that we deal with, they're usually resolved before the exam clock is ticking. So prior to the exam timer starting, which helps students keep their anxiety levels in check a bit. When uh, t speaking a bit about the misconceptions of uh, AI and flagging, you know, a lot of students come to the exam nervous about AI. Like I mentioned before, they think the system flags them, that that automatically means they're they're being accused of cheating, right? Um, with honor prep, we work to educate the students and institutions. Everyone has access to this about how AI is uh, it, how it actually works, right? It's not the judge and jury; it's more of an assistant in the whole proctoring process. The AI is going to flag things that might be suspicious, but but it's always going to be a human proctor or the student's professor or some designated reviewer at the institution. They're the ones who are going to verify whether any violation has occurred. AI is never going to accuse a student of cheating. AI is just going to identify behaviors, and then we're going to leave it up to the people to make those determinations, whether it be our proctors or staff at the uh, at the university. Uh, we also do we also do all that we can to limit AI interruptions during the exam. So we're not going to constantly um, bombard students with alarms telling them what they're not allowed to do. Um, we're going to warn them for things like, you know, trying to navigate away from their test or trying to use copy and paste if it's not allowed, trying to grab screenshots when they're not allowed. And those behaviors, excuse me, those behaviors will be blocked, but we'll we'll just let them know, hey, that's not allowed during this exam. But for the most part, we're going to stay out of their way and just let them focus on the test and try to keep their screen clear of clutter or information coming from us unless it's absolutely necessary. And then the, the third thing I mentioned that was a key anxiety driver was the misunderstanding about the proctor's role in this whole situation. So because students, some students feel anxious about the idea of, you know, a proctor watching them throughout their exam, that's understandable. And we take that kind of anxiety or that concern very seriously. So we make sure that our proctors are very well trained to approach students in the least disruptive way possible. They're skilled in de-escalation. Um, they're skilled in identifying when a student is feeling overwhelmed. So when they might be dealing with a, an overly anxious student. And when our proctors do need to intervene, it's all done via chat rather than any type of face-to-face -face video or audio interaction. That was another piece that came out of our study was students felt that was less intrusive, uh, less anxiety inducing where, you know, we had some students express past experiences where a proctor popped in and they were actually on video and they just felt like their heart rate go through the roof, right? And they were already nervous and that just escalated it to a whole new level. And now they kind of took the whole rest of their exam uh, on that, uh, on high alert. So just to kind of recap here, to close off, you know, test anxiety can hurt students' performance. Uh, our study certainly indicated to us that online proctored exams might be even more anxiety inducing than traditional in-person tests. And we've taken that challenge really seriously and are trying to continue to innovate and to create a frictionless student experience so they, they can show what they know without exacerbating, you know, pre-existing anxieties. So with that, thanks for your attention. And I'll hand it back to Darcy for any closing thoughts. And then we can open up for questions. Sure. Thanks. Um, that was great, Jordan. And uh, someone did ask, someone said that th their son got flagged. Uh, I don't know which proctoring service was, but the garbage truck was outside. And I, I said, honestly, I've seen a lot of proctoring services, but one of the things I love about this one um, in particular, and I'm not plugging it, I'm just saying that the AI flags something, but then the proctor can go back and review and see if it was a child coming to ask for dinner, you know, or what, whatever it might be that has nothing to do with cheating but without ever interrupting the student. And that to me is so important. Um, Megan, do we want, we have 15 minutes um, for questions. Yes, thank you everybody that has added questions and added the upvotes. I have 
pages of questions. So I don't know if we're going to get to my questions. We'll go ahead and prioritize the attendees. And I know Ian had to scoot off, but hopefully he views the recording and uh, receives your answers. But any recommendations for instructional designers in the middle of projects with a lack of institutional and program readiness? <laughs> oh, so fun. Um, I think from an instructional designer perspective, unfortunately on most campuses, you don't have nearly the voice that you should. So I would first uh, start talking to your, unless you are like the director or, or dean of online, if you have one, but talking to someone else in other leadership positions to indicate that you have concerns about this. Um, it's not too late to get people ready, but the institution is going to have to take some kind of change management, communications planning effort um, to get folks ready, to create your own internal list of what does readiness mean for our institution and our department. Um, you know, and that's something that, you know, I'm happy to talk to you further about, but it's so, um, it's not cookie cutter, right? So what you might do at your institution to really try to raise a red flag about not being ready and not having the faculty ready, um, depending on what kind of institution you're in, you may not be able to get there where another person could. Um, if there is so much resistance by the faculty for the program, that's something that's got to get up to the provost or VPAA or the dean of that school. I mean, there's got to be some recognition that you're, you know, busting your hump to get these courses ready, but you can tell that the faculty aren't ready, the institution doesn't have the supports ready, um, the quality, you know, standards aren't being met, but you, you're going to have to be assertive and find somebody that can champion this for you if you can't champion it yourself. So it's not too late, but you got to, you know, I won't say whistleblower, but you got to be the one that raises your hand because you are an instructional designer and you are seeing this. So it's a process and it would take communication and some change management, but could still be turned around, but it can't be turned around if the people in leadership don't know. So sorry, that's not a great answer, but um, it, it's, un, it's unfortunate when that, when programs are going forward and the school isn't ready or the institution isn't ready. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to, this is from an anonymous attendee. We allow faculty to share and come up with additional DQ and assignments by contacting class members. Is there a better way to do this? Okay, say that again. What? Uh, let me go back and read it. Is we it in the faculty to share and come up with additional DQ and assignments by contacting class members? Is there a better way to do this? To share and come up with um, anonymous intended, you may have to give me a little more, but yeah, I don't know if it's about. Um, um, is this so contacting? Your, the, we'll come back to that so, one. Let's come back to that one because I need to, are we talking about communications or are we talking about uh, a policy? I wasn't about, sure if it was along the peer assessment vein. Uh, okay, we'll go to this one. Are there any situations where a proctor will end the exam due to academic misconduct versus securing the environment slash correcting the behavior and then letting the student move forward? I'm going to take that one, Jordan. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, in today's world, we never end an exam for any uh, higher ed testing scenario. It, it, we only will we'll pop in, Proctor will get there as soon as they can, and focus on trying to get the student back on track. <laughs> if necessary, log a violation. About half the time that a Proctor intervenes, we are able to get there early enough in the process where we can de-escalate it and not need to log a violation, which is our, our number one objective. And then the other half of the time, either the behavior was just so egregious that it needs to be logged immediately, or maybe the behavior went on too long and, and a violation needs to occur. But in either scenario, 
there is no uh, ending of the exam from our proctor, just logging it and then letting the professor or the exam reviewer make the final determination of how to handle that at the institution. Great. There's a couple questions that were in the chat and in the questions, and it sort of aligned with some of my questions. So I'm going to try and mash them all together in something that makes sense. But um, there is a lot of what 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 happens if someone gets caught doing something naughty. Can we talk more about embedding empathy and what some of those assessment strategies look like so that we're helping support and ensuring academic integrity instead of the what do we what do we do when they get caught? So I'll, I'll give a couple <laughs> things on my end and then Darcy, you can feel free to chip in too. From uh, um, I saw some of the questions too and they discussed a little bit about prevention and things like that. So number one, a lot of the features built into Honor Lock are about prevention. So about one third of all the students that come and take an exam, they have some type of behavior that is prevented from ever even happening. That might lead them down a path where something more serious might've occurred. So one out of every three tests, there's something that we block that is not allowed based on the test's guidelines and we can prevent that thing from happening. And now it's no harm, no foul, essentially. Student tried to do something, it was stopped. They didn't. They weren't able to access any other resource as an example. And so now a professor does not have to deal with that down the road and the student kind of had that temptation perhaps nipped in the bud. So there are things that can happen during the exam. Um, and then one other thing I will mention is also the importance of the feedback to the student after a test has occurred. So if you kind of take the advice I shared and you're using proctoring on maybe an exam or two or like a low stakes quiz prior to a midterm or a final, that means students are gonna have some familiarity with proctoring. And in the process of getting that familiarity, what's also important is for the person doing the reviewing, whether that's a professor or someone else, to give the students some feedback on what they observed. So if a student does get caught doing something that maybe it's not uh, hard evidence that they tried to cheat, but it's just like, eh, that was a little bit out of bounds or it's not what I want to see on future exams. Giving them that feedback coming from the professor or coming from the reviewer is really vital because what we've seen is in our, in our data, very often we will even identify a very suspicious cheating incident, notify the institution about that, but then the student never hears anything from the institution about it. And so in their mind, they're like, well, yes, I got away with it. And that creates then some conversation amongst the student population where they say what they got away with. That drives some of that anxiety that I mentioned before, where now students who have no interest in cheating are hearing this chatter and it's like, whoa, what's going on? So that feedback can also help solve that problem. If once they know, once a student knows that a professor or a faculty member is paying attention to that stuff, word also gets out and you could kind of stop that train before it gets started on one of those lower stakes quizzes. And I'll add to that from a, the, a different perspective. You know, I feel like when I look at online courses, there may or may not, depending on if it's required or if the faculty member just wants to have it in there, there might be a link to the academic integrity policies for the institution. That's not enough. There should be a conversation with the students talking about academic integrity with them as a group and how it impacts not only their education, but the education of others. Um, letting them know, especially with AI, uh, and hopefully, you know, it's a whole other topic, but having an institutional policy on AI and then additional sort of sub policies, depending on the discipline, that's, that's important. But when a faculty member talks to students about you know, you're gonna get in trouble if you violate our academic integrity policies, why not have a conversation about what that really means and what it looks like and, and why it impacts not only them, but all of the other students. So that it's not just, here's the link to see our policy that they will not look at. In their mind, it just means don't cheat. Um, but getting into a conversation about it and communicating your expectations as a faculty member for the course and your, your expectations and your disappointment in those who get caught, that you you would be disappointed. So I think there's a couple of things that, that we could be doing better um, because I do think faculty, I mean, I do think students are in this mindset of um, it, 
of not getting caught if they try to cheat instead of thinking philosophically about why they shouldn't be cheating. And if they're desperate for answers because they don't know something, then maybe there's a way that they can have, you know, some additional support to learn the, the content better. Um, but I, I just, I believe that faculty, sometimes not all faculty are living in a gotcha culture, like looking for anything, you know, that they violated some rule or policy or, they looked at one answer and therefore they're a bad student forever. You know, I just, I feel like the conversations need to take place among the faculty and the students about what academic integrity means and what their expectations are. Great, okay. Um, so we, we just have five minutes left. So I think what we're gonna do is I'll have Kim slowly advance through the last few slides. So we make sure to touch on just our housekeeping slides and where Participants can learn more about WCT, but I do want to address this question because I think it's just becoming more and more important um, as we're all looking for sources of revenue in our niche market. So how do our attendees make the case for high quality online programs as a source of revenue? What, what's your question? Is that okay or is it? Well, so I think a lot of times it's, it's that we know online is great. We know our students want online, but how do we really make that case to our institutions and along the lines that it is a, a potential source of revenue, uh, maybe not immediately, but long-term. Well, it's kind of a dangerous topic because if the students, um, I mean, if the, the institution starts thinking in terms of this is a way to bring in revenue and they start driving the whole programming based on that, that's a problem. Now, the fact that students want online and that every institution in the, in the country is doing something online is a good thing. Um, and, and it's okay to want revenue and it's okay for them to increase enrollments. It just can't be the driver. So it's, it's kind of dangerous to put that out there that it can bring in revenue unless it's uh, packaged and described in the right way. So um, communicating that to institutional leaders, you know, I did a shameless plug a minute ago, and I'm sorry, but, you know, one of the things my group does are these 90 minute workshops about the framework that helps leadership understand what all the various pieces are so that if they do see that it can increase revenue, they don't get lost in the, oh, we just have to find something and put it out there and we'll have all these students and then get disappointed and not want to run programs anymore. So um, it, it is a matter of communication again. Um, and but it's being careful about how you frame it uh, as far as bringing additional dollars to the institution. Thank you, Darcy. Yeah, it's it's not a silver bullet by any means. So no, there thank people you everybody. Uh, any final remarks, Darcy or Jordan? This was great. Great questions. Great yeah, absolutely. And just one thing to say, uh, when Darcy mentioned the idea of, you know, having that conversation with students, I did just want to toss in, keep in mind, as she was sort of mentioning or, or hinting at, the majority of your students are honest and want to take the test and show what they know. And our data certainly shows that as well. So especially approaching that conversation from that perspective, where students don't feel like there's an accusation already being hurled at them, will generate a, a more trusting relationship between you and them. Totally agree. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And I do just want to give a shout out to our supporting members. They invest at a higher level because they believe in the good work that we do. So BYU, California State University System, CSU, University of Florida, University of Arizona, and Michigan State University. And final slide. So thank you for attending. Stay tuned for more WCT webinars. We're working on lots of fun things behind the scenes. So stay tuned. Thanks again. Be well, everyone. Thank you, everyone.